Nature's mama said May have heard this somewhere before Child, don't forget to cover your head Refugee Resettlement and the Hijra to America by Anne Corcoran With all the controversy surrounding Islam and the accusations of Islamophobia in light of worldwide terrorism, Anne Corcoran has given us a valuable resource in helping to understand immigration and the problems that occur when refugees are from Muslim countries. Now America is a country of immigrants, so this is not a new phenomenon. But if we take a close look at Muslim theology, its history, and the doctrine of Hijra, we should understand that the potential threat it presents to our culture as well as national security is very important. In the simplest terms, Hijra is migration. From the mind of Islam, it does not mean assimilation in the host country where it is considered equal. Hijra is a form of jihad in which the goal of the Muslim population is to strive toward imposing Islam and its religious law, or Sharia, on the occupied society. Since 9-11, we have become more aware of the militant version of jihad, but there are many ways that Islam uses to influence and put pressure on what it considers its enemy. A prime example of how immigration is used to proselytize Americans can be seen in the life of Imam Kazwini of Dearborn, Michigan, an Iraqi educated in Iran. He came here in 1992 for the sole purpose of spreading his Shiite version of Islam to the West. In his book, American Crescent, he is not a bit shy about his motives and he was quickly elevated to high levels of power in the political realm before and after 9-11. Over the past few years, Dearborn has been a hotbed of tension between Christians and Muslims in which evangelists have been harassed by Muslims and threatened by police resulting in David Wood and others having to sue the city over it. How does this happen in a country with Jewish Christian heritage where Bible quotes are found on founding documents and national monuments? Ann Corcoran explains how the steady drip of legal migration to Western countries opens us up to a new form of jihad that slips in like a Trojan horse. Dutch politician Gert Wilders and others have pointed out the reality of Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's observation that Europe would be conquered not with bombs, but with Muslim migrants overrunning their borders. Now we see shiploads of desperate Muslims being unloaded on the shores of Greece, Italy, and other countries, knowing that these socialist countries will go the extra mile to help feed them. Italy now has one of Europe's largest mosques in Rome. In America, the U.S. refugee and asylum laws are such that jobs are provided for contractors whose job it is to place these people in 180 cities around the country. These VOLAGs, short for voluntary agencies, are primarily funded through taxpayers who have little to no knowledge of what is involved. Refugee resettlement has become a cash cow for many in the religious left. The Church World Services in 2012 reported a total revenue of $76,185,774, of which 60% was taxpayer funded. Then the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services brought in a whopping $43,563,804 the same year. Then World Relief, a national association of evangelicals, totaled $56,842,649, with 68% of that was taxpayer funded. Then there's the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which claimed a total of 
237 at 98 percent coming from the taxpayers. Our author lists an interesting group of names who have been part of a revolving door of government employees who work with or for these VOLAGs. When we find that the United Nations is the one who picks the majority of the refugees, it makes one rather suspicious of their role as well as the goal. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, works closely with Antonio Guterres, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It might be worth noting as well that the wealthy Saudi Arabians, who play a key role in the OIC, receive zero refugees into their country. How these refugees have been screened in many cases has been a joke, which should not be a big surprise considering some of the countries of origin are failed states with next to no reliable records. Ann Corkin records some of the dangerous people who have slipped through the cracks and later caused us problems. The CARE organization and their attorneys are quick to fight for fellow Muslims against the evil U.S. government of infidels. Because of the U.S. involvement in the Iraqi war, Iraqi refugees have been a steady stream. In 2014, we received 19,769, bringing the grand total since 2007 to 104,671 spread out across the country, of which about 70% are Muslims. So we're bringing in two factions of Islam, both Shiites and Sunnis, which have been at war with each other for over 1,400 years. Then, thanks to President Bill Clinton, who got us involved in a war between Muslim Bosnians and the non-Muslim Serbs and Croatians, the door was opened for about 80,000 Bosnians to flood into Iowa, where many were put to work in meatpacking plants. Then in 1999, the Clinton administration was responsible for about 20,000 Albanian Kosovars coming to reside in America, the land of the great Satan. A more recent wave of refugees have uh, come from Uzbekistan due to America using their airspace in its war in Afghanistan. Now, Syrian refugees are knocking at the door due to thousands in UN camps. They are likely to be mostly Sunnis, given that Christians would probably not survive long in a refugee camp of Muslims. And Turkey is more than willing to pass these problem people on to the U.S. for any political advantage they can get. So, if you're on the list of 180-plus cities that the refugee contractors have targeted, you're in for a Muslim gift that just keeps on giving. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, when you ignore the theological and cultural implications, there's a great potential for a major train wreck, as was demonstrated on 9-11 when Muslims around the country were seen cheering as several thousand Americans were burning and jumping to their death from the Twin Towers. Then there are cases in which men use their Islamic rights to abuse and sometimes murder their wives or daughters, as with Qasim al-Hamidi of El Cajon, California, in year 2012. He was eventually found guilty of murder in 2014 when Allah was unable to bail him out. In England, the problem of Muslim sex grooming gangs has become a major nightmare for non-Muslim girls who are targeted as fair game. There's beginning to appear signs of the same thing in America as well. Iraqi refugee Muhammad al was sentenced to life in prison in 2014 for sex trafficking women and young girls in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Now, some of these characters are incredibly deceitful, as in the case of Jasim Ramadan, an Iraqi who was made famous in a book that was publicized on The Oprah Winfrey Show. 
but later, in 2014, was sentenced to 28 years to life for his involvement in a gang rape of a Colorado Springs woman who nearly died. Aside from these obvious burdens on American society, there are financial and health issues that come into play. Our author, Anne Corcoran, points out that some of the Volags are quite creative in getting their refugees on the American dole because of lack of skills or because of their inability to work due to health issues, and a large number end up on Medicaid or some other program for refugees receiving food stamps. The motivation for lobbying powers by these Volags is extremely strong. Under the umbrella of the Committee on Migration and Refugee Affairs, the CMRA, they wield very much influence on federal administration policy, but few in the general public understand how this all works. Thanks to Ann Corcoran, the curtain has been pulled back a bit for us to see a glimpse of the show. Become a Pocket Resistance by reading this book and shining the light on the shady side of Hijra.